Hello and welcome to the latest edition of the Manchester is Red podcast. I'm Tyrone Marshall, hosting today, joined by Samuel Lockhurst on day one of the first international break of the season. International breaks are always easier for Manchester United if they've won. They're always easier for us if Manchester United have won. Sadly, Manchester United did not win. Uh, 3-0, uh, beaten 3-0 by Liverpool at Old Trafford on Sunday. A pretty desperate way to end the first three Premier League games of the season and, and head into the international break. Samuel, me and you are there. First of all, how are you this morning? Have you have you got over there? Was it a shock yesterday? Well, I was I was just going to kick off really. Uh, Neil Custis, who obviously sits in front of us, he turned around at one point during the second half to me and he said, "This is this is shocking, isn't it?" And I said, "No, it isn't." I said it's the it's the same manager, um, and and we saw a lot of this last season, so. That is the problem, or one of many problems with United now. When they lose like that, when they get beaten three 0 at home, it's it's not a shock. We've we've seen it happen quite quite often over the past year. Yeah, I mean it's an incredible record, really. Of I think sixteen defeats now in the last forty one league games. I mean, where did it all go wrong yesterday? Then I know it's incredible, really, isn't it? It's um, it's fair to say Ten Hag has had a lot more rope than a lot of his his predecessors as, as United manager. But looking first of all, we'll, we'll go into the game in the first part and then maybe look at, at Ten Hag and what comes next in, in part two. I mean, where did it all go wrong yesterday? It kind of felt pre-match like we were still a bit unsure what to expect from either team. Liverpool have made a decent start on the slot in two fairly routine games. United had, had been marginally better under Ten Hag this season, not giving away as many shots. After yesterday, it feels like we have a much clearer indication of, of the trajectory of both teams and for United... Where did it all go wrong? Crikey, uh, that, that's that's <laughs> a very ex- that is a really expansive question. Um, I mean, the, the strange thing is, is that they they started quite promisingly. They were on the front foot. They were you know, c- carrying the ball into Liverpool territory, into Liverpool's third. They had a bit of purpose about them, but after maybe 10 or 15 minutes, it, it, normality resumed um, in, in terms of the, the the dominance regarding these teams' fixtures in, in recent years. And I mean, United had won a couple of times against Liverpool under Ten Hag. And I, I think I said just before, not long before Liverpool made it 1-0, that the game did feel reminiscent of the Old Trafford games last, last season, that Liverpool were by far and away the superior side. They were dominant. Um, they were taking the ball into United territory, but you also had a sense that United could possibly sucker punch them like they did in the league game with two pieces of genius from Fernandez and Maynou or or the FA Cup game uh, where somehow they won that game through emotion and adrenaline. They they didn't win that game through through tactics. And tactically, United are still a really uh, amateurish outfit. You saw with the disallowed goal yesterday, that that was a warning they didn't heed because it was the probably the first time that day um, yesterday that you had a Liverpool player running at United's back four or a pass that just bypassed their midfield. The midfield, I think we yeah, I've, I've said it so many times for me in the summer that was the priority, and you can't you can't put it on Ten Hag that United took until deadline day to get a midfielder in in Ugarte, but what you can pin on him was his failure last season until the FA Cup final to find a solution in midfield. And that solution in the FA Cup final was dropping Casemiro, who is now a player who's just started for four games on the spin for United, essentially by default. And he came off yesterday at halftime for an academy player who had never played in the Premier League before. That is how much of a fake force he is. And unfortunately, he's starting to drag Kobe Mainu down with him Whereas six or seven months ago, when those two were playing, Casemiro clearly benefited Mainu because he, he was the sentry. Mainu mm-hmm. would allow to go forward. But Mainu, you can cut slack because he's 19, because he's had a really taxing nine months or so. And he still looked weary yesterday, even though there was an eight-day gap between the games. And th- there's going to be a, a psychological, a mental toll as well as a, a physical toll on that. But... He, he he and United really need Manuel Agate to be very, very good when he comes in. They, they need him to be a silver bullet just for the manager to actually see out the season, it feels like already. 
that that midfield is barren beyond Mainu at the moment until Ugarte comes in. And, and Ten Hag was talking yesterday about how he might need weeks, maybe even months to get up to speed. Well, United knew they were signing a player from France. They knew they were signing a player who was likely to have uh, quite a long Copper America who wouldn't have a pre-season. And they faxed all those things into it and he was still their, their, their desired target for that central midfield position. But he was never going to play yesterday. And th- that was one reason why I didn't think United would win. Yet, as you said, we still don't know what we're going to get from United going into games. Are they going to surprise us like they did to an extent against Liverpool at Old Trafford last season and at Anfield last season when they got a credit draw? Um, but yesterday, it, it I mean, one of the worst things you could say about it was that it felt like when Klopp's Liverpool humbled Solskjaer to United, um, in that they, they showed mercy because they did show mercy yesterday. You think of that Suboslai opportunity where for some reason he didn't even bother shooting, um, going for goal. It was almost like he was taking the mickey and that should have made it 4 0. You had Liverpool fans growing Ten Hags at the will, having chanted Ole's at the will a few years earlier. And it, it felt reminiscent of them back then, that, that chasm uh, between the clubs. But tactically, United are just not. They're not a good side at the moment. Um, some of the selections yesterday as well. I mean, Matthias Sillet, I thought at nil nil was one of the possibly the only good performer in that United team. After the first goal went in, he, he was dragged down uh, like everyone else was. Uh, Ahmad, I, I didn't get dropping someone who'd scored a goal the previous week and was named the club's player of the month for August. That made no sense whatsoever. And clearly, Ten Hag. Uh, by keeping Rashford in the team, the the heart ruled the head because Rashford's got a good record against Liverpool. And in fairness to Rashford, he created two very good chances for a striker who United have just signed. Who, yeah, you know, his 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 history would suggest he doesn't actually score enough goals, which maybe he'll prove us wrong in England, uh, Joshua Zerksy. But that that was a clear red flag in, in signing him, and he had two great chances yesterday, particularly that the headed chance he, he should have buried that. So although fans did get on Rashford's back on um, one or two occasions on Sunday, um, he did actually create two clear-cut chances for United. And you, you had added to that as well with the Garnacho substitution because Garnacho is popular and he's the poster boy of the new United. There were thousands of United fans booing the decision to take him off. And Ten Hag didn't get asked about it because there was so much else to, to go at. But he, he, we know what he'd have said. He'd have said he's not played 90 minutes yet this season. Um, and and he, he, that's that's why he was he was preserving him. But, you know, it was, yesterday was just that nothing, nothing went right. Ten Hag claimed there were positives, but he didn't want to talk about them, which was... Which, which was sensible given the final score. But I, I'm really struggling to look at any positives from that game. I mean, he, he was talking afterwards, wasn't he? He said, oh, but the XG was low, as if to say we, they limited Liverpool's uh, Liverpool to you know, three chances. Because I think Liverpool only had three only had three attempts on target and they all went in. But if you're citing, oh, we kept, you know, we kept their chance at a minimum. We didn't really give them great chances. But you've just got battered 3-0 at home to your greatest rivals. You're on a hiding to nothing. Yeah, absolutely. There's the, there's no positives that I can see from that game. And one of the negatives was was Casemiro. There's no doubt who the four guy was for for that result. Two first half goals, two errors from Casemiro, hauled off for Toby Collier. I mean, Manuel Agati is going to need you some player to fix that midfield on his own, but he will certainly be an upgrade on Casemiro, who. Now might end up United's earner and third choice for for that position because Toby Collier certainly had a better forty five minutes than Casemiro did and his his decline is remarkable and on the contract that he's on he's going to become a major problem for United if I mean it's impossible to see how he starts a game at the moment because he's he's a disaster waiting to happen everything's happening half a second slower as he's improved at the start of this season but without being tested and there was an incident. In the Brighton game, where I can't remember who it was now, but one Brighton player just came on his shoulder and took the ball off him in exactly the same way Diaz did for the second goal yesterday. And we're just seeing these constant issues with with Casemiro. And I mean, it's bizarre as it sounds. You almost give credit to Sid, Sid, to Jim Ratcliffe here, who identified that in March in Casemiro's first season when we all thought, "What wow, what a signing! He's had a phenomenal influence." And he was, you know, supposedly questioning the wisdom of spending sixty million pound and. Giving that kind of contract to a thirty-year-old, and 
he has very much been vindicated, hasn't he? Because this this is now uh, a wage that is going to become a major issue for United for a player who it's just hard to see how you get him back in the team at the moment. He's been in decline for a year. He did not have a good start to last season. I was saying to you yesterday that it was 11 months ago that he was hooked at half-time with United 1-0 down at home to Brentford. And not much has got better since then. He obviously had an injury. He came back. He almost got sent off, it felt like, in, in two or three games. He had United fans trying to defend him and how he was treated differently. He wasn't. He was just slow and hopeless at keeping up with the pace. And he was lucky, certainly at Luton in February, to stay on the pitch. And Ten Hag, belatedly, um, you know, got it right with the FA Cup final by by dropping him. And I, I did feel slightly for Casemiro that day because he'd been he'd been fit for a while and he'd been consistently playing at centre back. And by playing at centre back, because that area was so depleted and not performing well there, um, and, and Amrabat coming in, Casemiro played himself out of the team for the FA Cup final because Ten Hag went with with Amrabat over him, and that was a call that was totally vindicated because Amrabat was excellent. And we thought that's got to be it for Casemiro, but even Saudi Arabia clubs uh, don't want him. And I know that that window is still open, but there's not there's no indication that at, at the time of speaking, anyway, that that's going to um, materialise. I mean, if you're if you're Dan Ashworth or Jason Wilcox, you probably want to move heaven and earth to try and make that deal happen. But even from a logistical perspective, it doesn't make a great deal of sense because it would leave United really light in midfield. And that 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 area is going to be an issue throughout the whole season because they've got, as their backup midfielders now, Mo Senior, a Casemiro and Christian Eriksen, who are two players who peaked in their first season. They There were immense short-term gains with those two coming in, but there's likely to be a lot of long-term pain because Eriksen will be released next year, of course. Uh, but I, I don't think anybody's expecting him to um, reach reach the heights of his first year at United, and, and Casemiro certainly won't either. So you've just got those two as, as squad players, and neither of them really are. It's it's difficult to you know, look at a game coming up where you think, yeah, they United are really going to need Ericsson or, or Casemiro starting that one. Yet they are the immediate reserves to Ugarte, a player who Ten Hag says is going to need time, and, and Mainu, who has not had a good start to the season, looks very um, fatigued and not not his not his usual self. But someone did put um, a package together of all of Casemiro's actions yesterday and there was that one wasn't there where he got the ball turned and then he just it was on the touchline he just lost it and the ball didn't go out but he just yeah. thought oh, I'll give it up this and and he just thought Jesus and I think he's last the last time he touched the ball it was just to hoof it into Liverpool territory and when Toby Collier was told to warm up rigorously just before half time everyone in nobody in the stadium needed to wait for the fourth official to you know, put the numbers, uh, put the number eighteen into his board to signal who was uh, who was coming off for Collier. It, it was just one of the worst. It, it's one of the worst forty-five minute performances I've seen from from United by. Yeah, undoubtedly, and you know, I mean players, players' bodies age and fatigue at different levels. But Mohamed Salah is four months older than Casemiro, and you know looks and plays like he's still in his early twenties and. Casemiro at the moment looks and plays like he's he's heading for for retirement. Like I said, I think he's still got two years left on his United contract, and hard to see how they get rid of him at the moment. Like we say, no takers in in Saudi Arabia and the midfield. I mean, the midfield was the problem throughout last season. It's perhaps not as glaring this time, but I need to watch it back to 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 get an exact number. But it felt it must have been 10, 12, 15 occasions where one of Liverpool's midfielders was just running at United's defence with options out wide, with options through the middle. It was time and time again that usually Schobelsly, occasionally Gravenberch or McAllister, would get the ball beyond Casemiro, beyond Mainu, and just run at a centre-back. A centre-back would have to come out. And this is just a constant problem that, that hasn't been fixed. And I mean, I, I mentioned it in the, the Five Things piece this morning. I think you make a good argument that United really missed Mason Mount yesterday, purely yeah, for... Yeah for the pressing in his energy. I mean, Tenag was asked who was going to press pretty much, and he, he just said Josh and Bruno like it was obvious, but United didn't press at all. And when you've got defenders of the ability of Van Dijk and Alexander-Arnold to pass the ball, 
it just caused them problems all afternoon. And it was, you know, it it, it was like it's, it's like it's gone from one pass to two passes now to just cut through that midfield. But it's still a real issue, isn't it? And on slot afterwards in an interview with uh, Sky, he pretty succinctly broke down how Liverpool beat United and, and identified the areas of you know, the, the chinks in United's armour where they were gettable. And clearly, you, there, was no, there was no pattern of the way United played. And when Casemiro got the ball, Liverpool players were clearly instructed to you know, swarm, swarm him, pickpocket him, uh, harry him because he's slow, because he's vulnerable. And that's how two of the goals came about. But that first, um, the first goal, I mean, Garnacho was going ballistic afterwards because he clearly felt he should have got the ball as he was in more space on the right. Casemiro went to the left. The ball was easily cut out. And you look at United's back four, the shape where when Casemiro passed the ball, it's like an arrow or it's a zigzag. It, 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 Masraoui's high up the pitch. Dallow's high up the pitch. Um, Martinez and Delit aren't in sync whatsoever. There's no shape about them at all. And one of the reasons why they were so good in the FA Cup final was because they were compact and they were tethered. And you could see they'd worked on their shape. You could see there was a it, that was that was going to be successful that day because there weren't gaps between them. They weren't gettable. They were shield. The back four was shielded. They've already regressed this season, and they've regressed with a 32 year old who the manager clearly clearly would rather not have. If when when Ten Hag was asked about Casemiro's future at UCLA during our sit down, there was a shift in his body language that I thought made it pretty obvious that he he can't say and he won't say publicly that I'd love to get rid of him. I'd love to send him to to Saudi Arabia or I'd love to send him to the MLS. But it's very very clear that he would rather not have him there. And in, he is one of these signings during the Ten Hag era who is not aligned with Ten Hag. I mean, it was a signing that um, John Murta did all the legwork on that was that was led by John Murta. Ten Hag obviously wanted Frankie Dion. That wasn't going to happen. Got battered 4-0 by Brentford. Uh, Ten Hag thought he could play Ajax football in the Premier League. Someone told him, no, you are going to need a defensive midfielder. They got one of the best in the, the last 10 years or so. And Casemiro was excellent that first season. But he's, you know, old father time has caught up with him. And to be starting the season with him, that was always going to be a problem. And you, I mean, Ten Hag, we know what we, he would say if he was asked about it. So we don't have another number six, but we've got one in Manuel Ugarte now. A more creative and better coach would find a solution elsewhere. One of the things, one of the most innovative things Guardiola did when he went to Bayern Munich was to take the best right back of his generation and put him in midfield. And then he was a brilliant midfielder, which was obviously Philip Lahm. Ten Hag has not done that. He's not even tried to do that. There was, there, in, last season, there was possibly a solution where he could take someone, put them or reinvent, put them in midfield, reinvent them. It would have been difficult. It would have been risky. Uh, you know, United were in, never in a stable place last season, it felt like. So there was that to take into account as well. You might have put some noses out of joint with other midfielders. But that's why Guardiola is, is the coach of the century. He's done things like that. He's played Rico Lewis in midfield. He he gets his fullbacks going into midfield. He's pretty much pioneered that strategy. And Ten Hag is always playing catch up, or you know, he's he's he's, he's just not trying it. And yes, that's although we all knew that it was going to be Casemiro and Mainu in midfield yesterday. We knew that was going to be dicey because. It, it had to almost be a repeat of what happened in the league and cup games at Old Trafford last season against Liverpool. The United to have got a positive result yesterday, i.e. for Liverpool to let them off the hook. I think we both we agreed at 1-0 that if Liverpool go 2-0 up here, that is the game done. They did. And the second half was, despite United having two or three pretty good chances, it, it felt like a procession. I mean, my, my match piece was, was done a, a good few minutes before the final whistle because it was it was that easy uh, easier match to write about because Liverpool strolled to victory. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you talk about finding a solution to number six. I mean, Liverpool used a midfielder that, that Ten Hag uses a number eight at Ajax as their number six, and he was probably the the best midfielder on the pitch. Um, yeah, certainly the best former Ajax player on the pitch in in Gravenberg and. Not a good not a good look for Ten Hag. I think it's it's fair to say. And, and just finally on the the game then. I mean, this is less of an issue when you concede three, but 
one of the big questions around United this season is where are the goals going to come from? That's two and three league games now, three and four if you include the Community Shield. I mean, one of the biggest issues with, with selling McTominay and maybe less mentioned is the fact that you've sold 10 goals from a team who didn't score enough goals last season anyway. And I don't think anyone who's come into that midfield is is going to make up that shortfall. I don't think Ugarte is. Casemiro is going to drop out, who was actually a goal threat at, at times, especially from set pieces. Mason Mount, for, for all his good work this season, doesn't strike you as a goal threat at the moment. And then you've got the forwards, none of whom really look like scoring. And I mean, Xerxes looked incredibly raw yesterday. And I mean, I said this through the summer, they've just signed another player in the mould of Hoyland who, who might have the talent to, to make it big in, in three or four years. But United don't have three or four years to waste. And there, there has to be a real concern this season, uh, just how they're going to score enough goals to, to make this season a success. And that's been an obvious issue for at least a year, maybe maybe two years. Best part of two years, we they're, they're always going to sign a striker last year. And Ten Hag would have loved Kane. United didn't test the waters, so they signed a, 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 poten- a potential striker for £64 million, rising to £72 million, who, a striker who was cal- you know, callow at the time. He's still, still quite raw, Rasmus Hoyland. And he had a creditable first season, I think, for United overall. But it was never going to be enough for United to have a successful season. And and it wasn't. And then Xerxes is, is too similar a profile of signing. Um, if he's 23, Hoyland's 21. Their goal-scoring records in Italy are nigh on identical, which tells you that neither of them are proven goal scorers. Yet United have invested more than £100 million in those two strikers, which is pretty much double the amount. City invested in fees for Erling Haaland and Julian Alvarez, and you see, yeah, you know, if you want to, if you want another statistic of the era of United's ways, there it is, and that's happened under two regimes as well. Uh, I mean, Xerxes he did look just completely out of his depth in the first half yesterday, in particular. At least in the second half, he got more involved. He got he, he got chances, but you need to you need to put them away. Mm-hmm. One of the one of my pet hates with um, United at the moment, well, not at the moment, it's been a while, but it seems to be a club that is always preaching, it will take time, it takes time. This is a manager who is into his third year who got schooled yesterday by a manager who's about three months in mm-hmm. at Liverpool. Uh, United finished eighth in the Premier League last season. This season before that, they finished above Liverpool. So the whole thing about it takes time, it does not wash. If they finish above Liverpool in a season, you've got to kick on. You can't be dropping like a stone to eighth in the Premier League table and you've got to buy players who are going to get you to where you need to be sooner rather than later. And Xerxes and Hoyland, hopefully for United, hope, you know, they, they prove me wrong and they can be prolific this season. And at least they have got to fit and functioning strikers when Hoyland does come back from injury because they only had one throughout the whole of last season. Hoyland had um, some, some injury layoffs as well that were pretty critical in terms of how it affected United's form, particularly when he got injured in February. But this is a team and a squad. It's it's not rocket science. Everyone can see it. They do not United do not have a dependable and proven reliable goal scorer. And Contract, despite all these pseudo intellectual stats coming into football about XG and all this nonsense, goals win football matches. You need goals to win games. United have won one game out of four, and one of the big reasons for that is because they haven't scored enough goals. They're on a goal difference of minus three already, and at, at least they're creating chances. That that will probably be one of the positives Ten Hag is mm-hmm. um, is, is alluding to. They're, they're creating chances. They had three or four attempts on target yesterday. Um, if he wants to go on about expected goals, uh, he, he could have done. Thankfully, he didn't in, in the context of the opportunities United have uh, had. But in their in their four games so far this season, they must have had a dozen good to great chances now that they've not taken. And that's because they've not bought a reliable goal scorer. And if they had tested the water with Harry Kane, I, I know a lot of big players have gone to United and failed. I, I'd, every, I'd, I'd have had every faith in him tearing it up for United and being a brilliant goal scorer for them, as brilliant a goal scorer for them as, as he was at Tottenham and as he was in his first season 
at Bayern Munich, but it's you can be you can, you can try and muddy the waters or try and be as convoluted as you like, but United don't have don't have a natural proven goal scorer in their team, so they're bound to struggle. And look what's happened they've they've lost lost two games already, and they they lost the Community Shield because they partly because they didn't take their chances. Yeah, absolutely. I think you look back at the window now and. United might have been wise to spend an extra five million to get someone like Ivan Tony rather than Xerxy, who who again I'm pretty sure would have embraced a step up and scored goals for United and would probably get more than Xerxy might this season at, at the very least. But that's all for the first part of the Manchester's Red podcast. We'll be back after the break to look at Eric Ten Hag's future. Welcome back to the Manchester is Red podcast. Uh, three games into the Premier League season then. United with one win, two defeats. I think they're 14th in the league table. They're eighth favourites to make the top four already. Uh, one market they are vying for favouritism in is next manager to leave his job, Ten Hag and Sean Dyche. Pretty much equal on that. Um, I mean, this was all just so, so predictable, wasn't it? That something like this was, was going to happen and... We said the start of this season was was going to be dominated by by talk of Ten Hag, given the fact that you know he, he didn't just come close to losing his, his job in the summer. He was going to lose it at one point. Ineos spoke to other managers, kept faith in the end, and the fact that something like this was going to happen was just really really predictable. And and you know you, you even listen to him speak now. I mean, all five goals United have conceded in the league this season, he's blamed on individual errors, which. You know, you can certainly see the case with with Casemiro and, and maybe maybe yesterday, but I think every team a goal concedes in the Premier League, you could point to an individual error somewhere, and these sort of excuses just aren't going to wash. And once again, his his future is under the spotlight already, isn't it? He struck me as uh, at his press conference, post match press conference yesterday, as a, as a manager who's run out of excuses, run out of rationale, and, and run out of ideas. Um, a colleague was. Tenag asked a colleague to actually explain, um, you know, I, you know, what, can you please explain what what we're doing wrong? Uh, what, 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 what's what's the correlation between last season, effectively? Because he, he seemed to bristle at the suggestion that that nothing had changed. And um, our, our colleague Ian Ladyman said, uh, const- constantly turning the ball over in your own half, playing the ball out from the back, getting mugged, chances coming on the back of it, counter-attacks when you're outnumbered, giving up endless chances in your own stadium against your biggest rivals. With the grace of respect, Eric, we've seen that so long now. And, and Ian's not wrong. And when a journalist is essentially enlightening a football manager on where they're going wrong, and the manager is... Good. Ten Hag was effectively in denial about that yesterday. He, he just queried it. He said, oh, you're sure. And he ended it by saying, I, I feel sorry for you. Um, I, I've, I've been very consistent on what I think should have happened with with Ten Hag. I think Ineos lost their nerve. They they clearly care that much about fan sentiment, but this is a very good example of why fans should never run a football club with a great sort of respect. And and I say that as as someone who's who's grown up as a football fan and, and would still consider myself a football fan. But you can't rule with the heart over the head with decisions like that, and that's what happened with the decision to keep Ten Hag. It, you can't also just dismiss it as an aberration or say, oh, well, Liverpool are really good and you know, lose a 3-0 to them. It's it's not the end of the world. We got tonks by them 5-0 a few years ago and 7-0 last year. But that's the feeling you get from how some, it, it, not, not people at United are, but some United fans, there's just this apathy about how mediocre they are and, and, and their status is also runs. But this is a manager who, during his time there, they've committed to spending more than £600 million on signings. And they finished eighth last season. And the start they've made this season, they're, they're, already, they're already on a minus goal difference. And they've lost two of their first three league games. And whether it's his signing strategy, whether it's uh, the tactical approach, um, whether it's the way he, he communicates in, in press conferences... There, there are issues there are plenty, and it was a slam dunk of a decision for Ineos just to change manager in the summer, which is I maintain is what should have happened, given that they had a new chief exec coming in 
inaugural sporting director, new technical director. And, and since they decided to keep Ten Hag, they've gutted his coaching staff. There are new coaches in there. They've got a new approach to um, signing players, even though there is still a, a continuation of, of Ten Hag's previous summers. Yet the manager is still the same. And I think Sir Jim Ratcliffe has underestimated the importance of a manager in football. And it's it's quite telling that people at United are referring to Ten Hag as the coach, not the manager, because they want him to be the coach. Um, he, he, the whole title change, that's that's not happened. His, his contract is still the same. They only um, extended it by a year. But I think when, when Ratcliffe said, you know, he said recently, oh, you know, he was trying to do too much. He was trying to sort the team out and fix the roof. Well, he wasn't doing that. I don't think he was even asked a question about the old Trafford roof after it started leaking against Arsenal. And you look at the way they lost to Brighton and you look at the way they lost uh, to Liverpool. Game management is a big part of that. And there's a reason why it's called game management because it comes from the manager. And his message is still not getting across or you know, he's, he's incapable of coaching the players in, in a way that will make United better this season. I, I still think look, I still don't think they're going to finish eighth or, or worse. Um I, I think they'll they'll finish higher than that. But the fact that we are already we've already come into an international uh, fortnight and the topic of Ten Hag's future has arisen is is so predictable. And I think we're almost bracing ourselves for potentially busy October or November international fortnights because they do strike you as opportunities for the United to change manager and the fact that we're also looking ahead to what their pitches are coming up and we look at it and think oh well three of the next four in the Premier League are away from home uh, until the, the October internationals and you start to think well you know what, what if this happens or that happens could they do it then and this was all avoidable if they just changed managers um in, in the summer and look, Ten Hag has, has got a lot of goodwill from United supporters because of the FA Cup final mm. but that's that's the problem he, he was kept on the basis of one game out of 52 games last season and you had some United fans saying look at the bigger picture look at the bigger picture we looked at the bigger picture and probably an even bigger picture and in this in a perverse way the FA Cup final was even um, evidence as to why they should change manager because United played out their skins in the one that, that mattered most and Ten Hag has been inconsistent with his messaging he'll say we didn't have the players available the right players available and then he'll say it's not about 11 players it's about a squad which he said a few times this season as well um, yeah, this this was all so 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 avoidable and as I said just yeah, been in the press conference yesterday and, and listened to what Ten Hag had to say. He he doesn't sound like a, a proper United manager anymore. He he just if he's going to just keep on harping on about we won two trophies in the last two seasons, nobody cares. It's ancient history. They finished eighth last season as well. Um, his first season was an excellent season. We you know, praised th their performance throughout that season and after that season ended, but. That was that was two seasons ago. Now you can't harp on about what what happened in the past. It's got to be about the present and what the targets are for the future. And I do think United squad is in a better place than it was at the end of last season. Um, yeah, not. I think there are pros and cons with all their signings, as they are with with most signings that that clubs make. But given. Dan Ashworth starting on 1st of July, Barada starting on 13th of July, the Enios Cabal had come in uh, officially in, in, in February and were getting their feet under the table. Jason Wilcox came in in, in April. It, it, it would have just been logical, given the performances last season, to have made that change in the summer after the season had ended. But they lost their nerve. And, and I'm not having this whole thing of, oh, there wasn't an obvious... Um, there was an obvious replacement out there. United finished eighth last season, but we, we'd rather not. We'd honestly rather not be talking about this because we're just covering old ground, and mm. we'd rather be talking about United having a positive start to the season and, and having a, a good result going into the the internationals because it makes our lives easier. But the fact that this is happening, I mean, there was a I think it was a German journalist who came in the press room yesterday who 
seemed almost offended that United kept had, had kept Ten Hag. Like he, he could not understand it. And th- th- what I go back to as well is that United see themselves within the same in the same bracket as Real Madrid, Barcelona, Bayern Munich. None of those clubs, there's no way the manager of any of those clubs would have stayed. He wouldn't even have lasted the season, by the way, had the club finished eighth in the league, bottom of their Champions League group, and won the German Cup or the, the Copa del Rey. There is no chance any of them would have kept their jobs. And there's nothing wrong, there'd have been nothing wrong with United changing managers um, in the summer. But you know, fan fan power won won in the end, and you know that's if if they're happy with yesterday, then I mean I can't imagine they are happy, and some were still being very supportive towards the end. But there, there are also times as well where Ten Hag does come across as quite desperate. He, he, I noticed when he came out for the second half, he almost paused to applaud the fans. It's almost like he's trying to draw attention to look how much support they they're giving me. They they'd be clapping him even if he'd got tonked five nil in the FA Cup final and somehow kept his job because they are just generally supportive. But trying to draw attention to that as well that that's another desperate measure he's taking. It feels like. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned the first season there. The first season was was built on pragmatism really after those early defeats and full credit for Ten Hag to being able to to do that. The, the defense yeah. was rock solid. Martinez and Casemiro were brilliant. Rashford had the season of his life. The challenge after that was always going to be to build an identity and we still don't have an identity and it, it is undoubtedly worse for, for Ten Hag, arguably embarrassing for Ten Hag that there is a Dutch manager stood six feet away from him yesterday who's had three games in charge who has already got an identity into a new team and, and that looks bad for him and you know, I, I go back to that, that camera shot that we saw on Sky about nine minutes from the end of... of the Ineos figures in the director's box. I think Brailsford and Ratcliffe sat next to each other, then Barada, Ashworth and Wilcox, and they all looked pretty glum. We've all seen the images of, of Ratcliffe with his head in his hands. I mean, in, Ineos, sort of, on the football side of things, they've had a pretty good start, generally, I would say. The transfer window, I think, is, was good. You know, full judgment will come later, but I think we all feel it was pretty good. But you just can't get away from this, this one decision. And... If it all goes the way we expect it to, and at some point they do have to change the manager, and if it's early this season, it's just going to look embarrassing for them, isn't it? And this one decision it is going to set them back. I don't think there's there's any doubts about that if it ends the way we expect it to. No, and no, I, I think with with uh, Ashworth and, and Barada, they, they started, officially started anyway, after the decision had been taken to keep Ten Hag and, and extend his contract. So... Those two guys, when when it comes to that decision, and it will come, whether it's in October or November or in a year's time or, or whenever, when it comes to that decision, they can wash their hands of the initial um, call to, to to stick with Ten Hag after the cup final win, and that that was partly also that that was a reason why United didn't sack him. There was still weirdly, even though Ineos were in the building, there was still a bit of a power vacuum there because Barada and Ashworth were on gardening leave. Was the Dave Brailsford really going to be the man who decided to tell the United manager he was he was getting sacked? Was Jason Wilcox going to take that decision at that time, having just come from the Championship club? It, it felt like they were not in a robust enough place to be able to make that decision. Strangely enough, even though this is a, a petrochemicals company and this is a, a this is Britain's. Um, Britain's richest man as well, so clearly tough decisions have been have been made uh, over the course and of, of his lifetime. Probably tough decisions and then sacking the manager after you know losing losing nineteen games last season. But it did feel as though that had a bearing on it. Yet they have got all the key figures there now. So if they need to make that call, and none of us are expecting them whatsoever to do that before the Southampton game next week whatsoever uh, that, that that would be uh, a surprise and I think it's safe to say that that won't happen but they yeah it, it, I, it, it's, 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 it's almost quite quite tedious uh, for us just to cover all this old ground because this was also avoidable it would be much it'd be easier just to discuss 
how United are under a new manager because mm. that is what should have happened in the summer. And I know there are a lot of fans who disagree with that and there was still, yeah, still a friend of mine who's a season ticket holder. He's still not the opinion that they should change manager. But I, I can confidently say that there are three managers who have managed United to the title and, and Ten Hag won't be the fourth. And sometimes it does come down to something as simple as that. That has to be the aspiration for United to win the, to win the Premier League title. Is that genuinely? Is does anyone genuinely think that is going to happen under Eric Ten Hag? And uh, yeah, personally, I unfortunately for United, I, I do not think that will happen under him. I'll, I'll be delighted if he proves me wrong, but I suspect he won't. Yeah, I think uh, you know I would undoubtedly agree with that. And this is a story that's going to run and run. I mean, after the international break, United have got Southampton away, Barnsley home, Crystal Palace away. It, it, it looks a week that should be relatively routine. It's a week that with United under Ten Hag, we know probably won't be. And it's it's going to be a big spell. But that's all for now. Looking back at the Liverpool game, I'm sure you've heard enough about that 3-0 defeat. Don't talk about that too much longer. Uh, thank you for joining me today, Samuel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ty. Uh, myself and Stephen Railson will be back later in the week to look at anything that's developed during the international window and a few other topics around United. So... Remember to subscribe to get that in your feed, probably on Friday, I think. Leave us a like and a review. But for now, thanks for listening and speak to you all soon.